Now, uh, it falls to me also to introduce Paul Copan. Paul is here? Yes, there he is. Oh, good. Uh, Paul was born in 1962. He's a Christian theologian, analytic philosopher, apologist, and author. He's currently a professor at Palm Beach Atlantic University, uh, holds the endowed Pledger Family Chair of Philosophy and Ethics. Uh, he has written and edited more than 25 books in the area of philosophy, of religion, uh, on apologetics, on theology, science and religion, and the historicity of Jesus Christ, as well as contributing many articles to professional journals and essays for edited books. For, him, for six years, he served as president of the Evangelical Philosophical Society. I've heard Paul speak on numerous occasions, and I know you're in for a repeat today, so please join me for the warm welcome for our speaker, Paul Cohen. Space. So it's, uh, she's a physical therapist and just well organized as it is, so, uh, so I try to get my stuff in order here. And uh, I keep an eye on the clock too, so I'll take up my watch. All right, well, thank you, Bruce, for that introduction, and I'm glad to be with you all. Thanks for joining, uh, joining me on a, a rainy Atlanta day. It's good to be back in Atlanta. I've lived here for about six years. And uh, Bill Smith and I worked together at uh, Ravi Zacharias International Ministries and had a wonderful time of um, working together and uh, speaking in, uh, in, in venues like this. Uh, we, <clears throat> you may be aware that uh, just yesterday began the uh, 100th uh, anniversary of remembering the uh, Armenian genocide by the Turks. And uh, so over a million uh, the million point five um, uh, Armenians who were killed by the Turks. In fact, the, uh, my dad's in the Ukraine, where there's a uh, uh, very disturbing uh, business going on with uh, Putin and, uh, uh, and the invasion of Ukraine and uh, uh, more uh, such uh, activity uh, looming. Um, it seems you know, there are rumors in the air that uh, Kiev is next. Uh, and that this is the, uh, that uh, there are rumblings of something happening in May or even June um, to, toward that end. And uh, my dad's from Ukraine, and uh, my father, uh, his, grand well, his grandfather, uh, died as a result of um, starvation uh, through the uh, Stalin's uh, forced famine in Ukraine. So, uh, so again, that was, uh, uh, you know, part of my own history. Uh, but. Uh, but here we are talking about the question, did God really command genocide? And, and what, does that, uh, you know, what does that look like? A lot of people, like Richard Dawkins, will say that God is this uh, genocidal uh, maniac uh, who is, uh, is, is commanding the, uh, the Canaanites to be slaughtered and so forth. Well, is this, uh, you know, you know, is this a fair charge? Uh, how do we differentiate between what's going on in... Ukraine, or what's going on, what went on in uh, in Armenia, uh, with the um, you know with what's going on in the Bible. So what we hope to do is unpack some of this, and uh, again we'll have room for question and answer. There is a book uh, over there uh, that goes into a lot more detail and has summary uh, bullet points at the end to uh, to help digest some of the uh, you know some some you know some more philosophical discussions. But this uh, hopefully will help to. Uh, give you a good foothold for watching into the into the chapters themselves, but uh, the book is called *The God Lake Man Genocide*, as already mentioned. But what I'd like to do is address this topic by looking at a lot of preliminaries first. There's a lot of unpacking to do before we look at actual texts, and uh, and so what I'd like to do is spend the majority of time kind of preparing our preparing us for going into those uh, texts. Uh, and then, uh, then we'll, uh, as I said, probably not have a lot of time for a QA and uh, a immediately, but uh, save up your questions for, uh, for later. <clears throat> well, as we look, first of all, at the preliminary considerations, uh, the first one that we ought to remember is that God issues certain commands in a context of a warfare uh, society. Uh, war is part of the ancient Near East. If you uh, are not prepared to do battle, you will inevitably become extinct. Uh, you know, so, so this is 
part of the ancient Near Eastern society, uh, the culture uh, in which you, you find yourself, that, that fighting is simply a part of this. And, and God speaking in the, this set of inferior circumstances, Jesus says God permitted certain things because of the hardness of human hearts. So we see human heart-heartedness uh, here in the, uh, in the engagement of, uh, you know, of uh, just constantly battling and invading and so forth, and that God uh, uses this uh, in the accomplishment of his purposes. But more on this later. We also need to remember that there are commands that God gives that are not joyfully given, that are not given in a positive way. They're not given in a spirit of delight, but rather with reluctance, just as God was grieved to bring judgment upon the earth during the time of Noah. So God issues commands to drive out the Canaanites, not because he is delighted to do so, but uh, he does so with a heavy heart. Uh, and God himself tells the, the Israelites, uh, or, you know, the Judahites in, uh, in, in uh, Ezekiel 18 and 31, that, you know, that God doesn't delight in the death of the wicked, but rather that the wicked turn from their evil ways and live. He says, why will you die, O house of Israel? So God is reluctant in bringing judgment. In fact, Lamentations 3 tells us that God does not afflict willingly. Uh, so this is not something that God is just, you know, really doesn't care. He, he, no, there is a, a grief in his heart when he uh, brings judgment. So we see that this is connected to the state of, of, of hard-heartedness, that, uh, that God does issue commands given human hard-heartedness, but God is also willing to receive those who repent. In fact, when Jonah goes to Nineveh, he is, uh, you know, he, he's reluctant to go to the place uh, where his enemies are because he is afraid that they are going to repent because he knows, as he says in chapter 4, that God is gracious and compassionate slow to anger and abounding in loving kindness, that God would do this sort of thing, that this is characteristic of God, and he didn't want that to happen to his enemies. And certainly this happens, we see this with, uh, with Rahab, uh, who becomes a follower of the, uh, the God of Israel. We see the Shechemites in chapter 8, who join this uh, covenant renewal ceremony with Joshua, these strangers in the midst of the, uh, you know, of the Israelites, who are part of this covenant renewal ceremony, these are Canaanites but yet they're joining up with the Israelites. They recognize who the, the one true God is. We see this, uh, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll come to this in, in just a moment, uh, about the signs and wonders. But we see that there is a, along with the, uh, these commands, we need to remember that there is a distinctiveness, that there, that there is a, an unfolding of the plan of salvation that God has, that there are unique circumstances that God is calling his people to undertake. When God calls Abraham, to leave Ur of the Chaldeans. He sends, sends him to a place where he doesn't know. He sends him to the land of Canaan. Uh, but that doesn't mean that we should say, well, therefore, we ought to do this too and pick up and, and we need to move to a place where we don't know. Uh, well, no, this is a unique command, a unique calling. And similarly with the Israelites, they have unique commands and a unique calling given their status in the unfolding of God's salvation historical plans. So we, we need to talk about things that are temporary because a lot of people will say, oh, look at what God committed. No, he could just do that today. Uh, and, and, and as though everything that took place back then can be universally applied. No, this is for a particular circumstance at a particular period of time. And you know, we do this with our kids. You know, that when they're growing up, we tell them to, you know, not to do this, to do that. And, you know, they, you know, you know, and you know, we, later on, they actually may do some of those things um, that we have uh, clearly uh, you know, misguided, clearly in, in error here. Also, uh, an act would be obligatory only if God actually commanded it. Uh, and so it's not obligatory if one imagines that God commanded it. It's not justified if one imagines that God commanded this. Uh, and so it would be right only if, and we need to remember this too, you know, we're talking about a God who is good, wise, rational, just, and so forth. That if a good, wise, and just God commands something, again, we ought to do it. But is this blowing up a, a bus of children what a good, wise God would command? Uh, well, you know, God may have certain overriding circumstances for, uh, for certain things that we talk about in, in Scripture. But, you know, you know, you know we, we need to also need to consider that there is, uh, you know, did God actually command this? And we, we can also add this, that... Is this command surrounded by the kinds of signs and wonders that we see going on in 
the land of Egypt and in the promised land that God has taken the Israelites to, we see that there, there is this reinforcement, uh, this divine uh, you know, stamp of approval that God has approved of Moses as his spokesman and so forth. Anyway, we can, we can go into more detail here, but, uh, but uh, in the interest of time, let me keep going. There's also another consideration here, and uh, a lot of times people like Richard Dawkins will use the, uh, this criticism of, you know, look at the Israelites, you know, here they are just you know, in the worshiping the golden calf, and God just gets so angry with them, and he's just so jealous and capricious, and you know, this just seems so out of proportion. Uh, well, when you look at what God is actually doing, when you look at how God is calling the people for himself, making a covenant with them to be a blessing to the nations, that there are certain stipulations that God has for them that if violated would utterly undermine the identity and the mission of this people in the world. So when they are worshiping the golden calf, when they are in Numbers 25 engaging in idolatry and adultery with the Midianites as part of a subversive plot that Balaam came up with, that this is tantamount to treason. That this kind of activity utterly undermines the covenant that God has made with the people of Israel. That the very reason that God has called them into existence to be a blessing to the nation is now being jeopardized. It's now being compromised. And God is justifiably angered by this. Another thing to keep in mind as we look at the, uh, the driving out of the Canaanites is that this is the, the moral degradation of the Canaanites is, you know, you know, is, uh, you know, is, is, at a, is at a maximum capacity, so to speak. That God tells Abraham himself uh, in, uh, in Genesis 15, 16, that he's going to wait for the sin of the Amorites to be filled up or to be completed. So we're talking about you know, well over 400 years that God is saying he's going to wait. God is being patient. He's waiting until this time is filled up. God is not going to command the Israelites to drive out the Canaanites until the timing is right, until they have reached their moral low point. So Israel has a right to the land, but only under the circumstance where God can now drive out the Canaanites before them. Not before this. They would not have been justified in driving them out before. When you look at Abraham and his engagement with the Canaanite peoples, you know, there is a, a kind of a friendly engagement that you know, Abraham does some things wrong, but, but there is a general goodwill that we see uh, in the you know, earlier you know, portions of the Bible in Genesis where, where there is good engagement with the Canaanite peoples overall, uh, that, there, that they have not reached that moral low point that God is anticipating. Now, God himself tells the Israelites that if they do the sorts of things that the Canaanites will do, that he will also drive them out, that they will be spewed out of the land. Indeed, they were. When they were mimicking what the Canaanites were doing, in, five, sorry, in 722 BC, the Assyrians come in and bring divine judgment by God's hand uh, onto the Israelites because of their disobedience, because of their idolatry. We see this happen with Judah in the southern kingdom, uh, that in 586, 587 BC, the Babylonians come in and bring destruction. Uh, so, so they are being vomited out as well. So it's, a lot of people say, well, God is just favoring the Israelites. God is saying, no, the same sorts of things that, you, that the Canaanites have done, if you do them, uh, the same consequence is going to come to you. Uh, God is speaking with great justice here. As we read in other portions of the Old Testament as well, <clears throat> another part of the preliminaries is that uh, that God does have an overarching concern for the Canaanite peoples. That, of course, God welcomes Canaanites into the land, into the people of Israel, that if they're willing to turn from their ways and join with the Israelites, uh, that, that they are, they become part of the people of God. And we've already seen Rahab and the Shechemites, um, and you know, to some extent the Gibeonites, who, uh, who join up with the, the Israelites, even though uh, by deceptive means. So we see you know, in the scriptures, in the Psalms, in Zechariah and so forth, that God is concerned about bringing reconciliation and incorporating the, uh, the peoples who are the enemies of Israel, including the Philistines, the Assyrians, the Babylonians, the, uh, you know, you know, all of these you know, public enemy number one uh, sorts of people in Israel. 
God is working toward the redemption of these people. And he includes the Jebusites in here, the people who are in the, the Canaanite inhabitants near Jerusalem. They were also part of this broader picture of salvation that God had in mind. These would be incorporated into his people. So, so it's not as though there is some sort of ethnic animosity or ethnic favoritism. In fact, uh, you know, the, if you put a, a Canaanite and an Israelite next to each other, they would look the same. They would speak the same language. They would dress the same. And you couldn't tell them apart. Uh, so it's not as though there is something intrinsically distinctive about the Israelites. Um, you know, but there is a remarkable, you know, uh, you know, not only similarity, but there's also a concern that God has for their ultimate salvation, even if now they're living uh, morally degraded lives. In uh, Deuteronomy chapter 7, uh, if you read that text, uh, it, it's interesting that it says, you know, you know, utterly destroy them, leave alive, nothing that breathes, and so forth. And then it goes on to say, make no treaties with them. Do not intermarry with them. But I thought they were just supposed to be wiped out. And then it goes on to say, uh, no, don't intermarry with them, etc. But it does go on to say, destroy their religious paraphernalia, destroy their idols, their, 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 their altars, and so forth. You know, that you are to destroy all of those things that have the mark of this, this false, uh, you, know, uh, you know, morally degraded uh, religion. Uh, so God seems more interested in destroying Canaanite religion than he is in destroying Canaanites. Uh, and we see that in Deuteronomy chapter 7, verses 3 through 6. And you can look at that text yourselves. Uh, and then there is another, uh, another uh, consideration here. Uh, that you know, a lot of people, when they use the language of genocide, it actually is not even in keeping with how we use that language today. For example, in the trials in the, you know, uh, concerning atrocities in the former Yugoslavia, uh, we see that there is a remarkable... Uh, you know, uh, again, you know, of course, justifiable trials for these atrocities. But the term genocide was used, you know, or was basically set aside in many of the cases because it just wasn't clear that this indeed was what, uh, what was the, the purpose. Uh, the total destruction of the whole or most of the people uh, group aimed at their physical disappearance from the earth. This doesn't seem to be the concern that God has in issuing this command. It does not fit in with the, even the, the modern-day uh, definitions of genocide. Uh, and again, in the, in the book, we go into a lot more detail on some of these, uh, these um, modern-day uh, uh, human rights uh, trials, uh, these crimes against humanity uh, trials with uh, people from the former Yugoslavia uh, involved. Uh, so, so again, would encourage you to take a look at that. But again, even according to the modern-day definitions, it doesn't fit with what the scriptures are saying. Now, let me move on to, to discuss some of the texts that we have uh, before us. Uh, you know, and again, I've, uh, I'll, I'll mention some of these uh, just in general, assuming that you have an idea of what these texts are about. Uh, but I want to explore some of the now biblical uh, material related to these, uh, you know, the, the, the Amalekites and uh, the Midianites and so forth. So let's look at some of these warfare um, texts in Scripture and, and uh, try to put them into proper uh, context. The predominant command that we see in the Pentateuch uh, you know, related to the Canaanites is that of driving out or dispossessing them. Remember that God has promised a land to Abraham, but it cannot come to his descendants until the people are sufficiently corrupted that they could be driven out. And so we see the majority of commands being to drive them out, to dispossess them, to remove them. And the, the language of dispossession or removal or driving out is not the language of killing or literally destroying them. So, so you know, for example, this term is used when Adam and Eve are driven out of the Garden of Eden. Uh, this is the language that is used when we see David driven out from the presence of Saul. Uh, this is the language that we see of people who are removed from one location, pushed out, but again, they are still alive once they've been pushed out. So it, again, if you're driving them out, they aren't being killed. And this is the dominant language that is being used. Uh, now, also, what's interesting here is there's kind of like a triad. If you think of a, a, pure, a, you know, a pyramid or a triangle, where you have at the top the deity in the, the land of Canaan, you know, the, the ancient Near Eastern deity. And then at the bottom you have the people, 
and the religion, or sorry, the people and the land. You had, so you have this triad of the deity, the people, and the land. If you drive out the people from the land, this is actually a way of showing the superiority of you know, you know, the, the people who are driving them out over the local deities here because there is a close connection to the land, to productivity and so forth. The people identify with this, this, uh, this chunk of real estate uh, as part of their you know, God-given right or something. Their deity is, is over this uh, portion of land. Well, to drive them out, stabilizing of their own religion and even rethinking like, how could our God allowed this to happen. Uh, you know, this is his land. How can we be removed from it? It's, what's even more interesting is that you have God, the one true God of the Israelites, actually engaging this kind of activity in the land of Egypt, kind of pre creating a, a destabilization uh, of the theology of the Egyptians, because here, routinely, God is just one after the other, uh, you know, attacking and undermining the deities of the Egyptians. So he's doing it in another land. Uh, that he's going to take the Israelites out of, but yet there is this kind of destabilizing factor uh, that is part of the equation. So we see that there is this uh, language of driving out, and we need to see this in a kind of twofold manner. But that there is a, first of all, the command to drive out is the first phase, if you will, that, that God commands them to be driven out. In fact, in, in Exodus 23, the very first time we see this mention, God said he's going to drive out the Canaanites. Like, you know, hornets are going to, you know, drive, you know, you know, drive them out. You know, this is how God is wanting to, to work, to drive out the people. And then the people, as they show their stubbornness, as they uh, show their rebellion and so forth, the process gets slowed down. And then there is also warfare that is attached to it that they're going to be engaging in. But it is a two-phase operation of driving them out. And those who remain behind leave themselves vulnerable to attack. So driving them out, and if people remain behind, then they are vulnerable to the attack of the Israelites. And of course, typically what, what happens is that you do have the, the more vulnerable, you know, the non-combatants that, that flee, the, the, the women, the children, the elderly, and so forth. This is what is, uh, you know, how things typically operate in the ancient Near East. But if they stick around, then they become vulnerable to attack. A second point that is made in, uh, in this, uh, as we look at the text, uh, that often raises eyebrows, and what we want to do is unpack this a little bit, is to note the hyperbolic language that is being used in not only Joshua and Deuteronomy, but also in the ancient Near Eastern war texts overall, that we see a high degree of hyperbolic language that is used. And if you read this in the ancient Near Eastern context, you would not think, oh, there literally was not one survivor left. You would think of it more in terms of, you know, it's, a, it's in a lighter sense, uh, but like a, a basketball team saying, oh, we totally slaughtered our opponents. You know, we annihilated them. You know, no one takes that language at face value. And in the same way, in these war texts, you wouldn't take that language at face value. That we utterly destroyed them, we left alive on the breeze, there were no survivors. No, you have a very you know, hyperbolic language here. And to, you know, in, in fact, as we look at the ancient Near East, in fact, you read about this in Kenneth Kitchen's book uh, on the reliability of the Old Testament, uh, in which he looks at these texts and he highlights how this was standard fare in the ancient Near East, where you could have a narrow margin of victory. And you could say, we utterly destroyed them. You could, you know, like even um, King Misha, who was mentioned in uh, 2 Kings chapter 3, uh, as a, the king of Moab, we have an inscription from him saying that Israel is no more. It's kind of humorous when you think about it. I mean, who's heard of Moab these days, you know? But, uh, but here you have Israel is no more. He's saying this. Well, we, we obviously know that Israel hung around. Uh, we, you know, as we, you know, we see other inscriptions, you know, I, you know, I turned them to ash. Again, it sounds like utter annihilation, utter destruction, but in actual fact, you, you don't have, you know, anything resembling, uh, you know, utter annihilation or destruction. Indeed, we see this sort of a thing in the text itself of the scriptures. As we look at the scriptures, we see this. 
Um, in fact, as we look at not only Joshua, but as we look at Judges, we see, as we set these texts side by side, that there is more like a gradual infiltration rather than this uh, dramatic military blitzkrieg that takes place. <laughs> It is something that takes place, and uh, from an archaeological point of view, the evidence shows that it takes a couple of hundred years before this transition shifts, uh, to, you know, is made from you know, these, these Canaanite deities to Yahweh being the national deity in that land. It takes a long period of time before the transition is actually made, and this is indeed what the book of Judges reminds us of. Again, you see repeatedly, they could not drive them out, they could not drive them out, they could not drive them out, they could not drive them out. But doesn't Joshua say that we utterly destroyed them, that the land found rest on all sides? Well, Joshua does say this. This is the kind of the war text, uh, kind of classic war text uh, that fits in with the, the ancient Near Eastern genre. But even Joshua himself will say at the end in chapter 23 that there are many nations that still need to be driven out of the land. But that the land had rest on every side. And then at the end, Joshua is saying this. What's going on? Well, if you understand that this is ancient Near Eastern hyperbole or exaggeration, it, it, it fits very nicely uh, with, you know, it, it fits the facts. In, as a, you know, in, in, just in case you're wondering, let's take a look at these, uh, these, these passages here where we see, on the one hand, language of extermination, totally destroyed them, etc. And then we see those same people who are allegedly utterly destroyed back in action, it seems. So wherever you seem to see utter destruction, you also see those people reappearing as though there hasn't been this total slaughter uh, that uh, allegedly uh, took place. So we see that you know, Joshua 10, sometimes in the same verse or same chapter or a couple of chapters later, we see that those people who have been exterminated uh, or have not been exterminated. Uh, so Joshua 10, Joshua and the Israelites had finished slaying them with a very great slaughter until they were destroyed. And the survivors who remained of them had entered the fortified cities. It's the same verse, my friends. You know, they're destroyed. But then the survivors went you know, so, so what's going on here? Well, if you understand that hyperbole, it, it, it fits very well. Um, in the land, you know, the, the town of uh, Devere, uh, 10, uh, Joshua 10, 39, all utterly destroyed. And then it says later on in chapter 11 that Joshua utterly destroyed the Amalekites in Devere. But I thought that that already took place. Well, there's, there's more going on here, if you understand that hyperbole, that exaggeration. Um, the Amalekites in Hebron uh, were cut off, utterly destroyed. There were no Anakim left in the land. And then Caleb drives out the you know, Anakim in Hebron, uh, you know, just uh, you know, a little bit later. So, so again, I can, I can add more, you know, I've given you more in this chart to, uh, to, uh, to go through, but, but this is the sort of thing we see repeatedly. So it does fit in very well with the literary genre of war texts that there is utter destruction mentioned, total annihilation, and then lots of survivors. Now this, you know, as we look at the archaeological picture, as we look at even the, you know, the, the biblical picture as we, you know, as it's played out in the book of Joshua, we see that the, even the battles in these cities of Canaan are not, like I said, total military blitzkriegs where everything is utterly destroyed. We actually see a these uh, what are more like military raids, uh, disabling raids, as Kenneth Kitchen calls them, where you have these cities being attacked, which, and again, these cities are not where you have uh, you know, civilians. Uh, you might have an occasional innkeeper like uh, in Jericho, uh, who's a female. But typically, this is where the political and you know, military and religious leaders are. It's where grain is stored, you know, the taxes and so forth, that it was guarding the, uh, these, these granaries, these storage, uh, storage you know, places. But, but as the Israelites go into these cities, they disable them, and then they go back to their base camp. So it's not as though they're just taking over one city after another. They are raiding, disabling, and coming back to their base camp at Gilgal. Uh, so this is, the, you know, again, it's interesting to note that as you look more closely at the text, again, not glossing over the text, but actually digging into the text more carefully, you start to see some, I think, a, a more subtle picture uh, developing. You start to see layers. You start to see some nuance here. And so and I, was on, I had a debate with um, Norman Backrack. You can listen to it on, uh, you know, on YouTube or you can you go to my website. But, but uh, he was the leader, he's the leader of the uh, Humanist Association of London. And 
Uh, and he was saying, well, look, how much plainer can the, can the text be when it says they utterly destroyed them, they utterly destroyed them, left no survivor. I said, well, you're only reading one side of the ledger. What about the other texts that say there are lots of survivors? What I'm trying to do is get you to look at both sides. Rather than just kind of stacking them up on one side and say, oh, look at how terrible you know, all of this is. Look at this slaughter. And when you fail to consider the you know, many survivors that are there, that this is speaking using hyperbolic language, what I'm trying to do is get you to remove that distorted language and actually look at the more realistic picture here when you see these two things held in tension. If you take both of them literally, you know, they would contradict each other. And so in the same way, we need to look at the text uh, you know, in all of its facets to try to see what is it saying. Now let me say something about the, uh, the Midianites. Again, the language that is used of them is, you know, you know, utter, you know, utterly destroy them and so forth. So we see in Numbers 25, I mentioned this, the Midianites uh, seduced the Israelites, which I, I said is tantamount to uh, treason, uh, that God commands retribution. And here's what God commands. Uh, in 31.7 of Numbers, it says, Israel fought against Midian as the Lord commanded Moses and killed every man. So as the Lord commanded Moses, and he, they killed every man. Now, they did what they were called to do. They fulfilled this task. Now, Moses, however, actually, it seems, goes beyond this. You know, even though they had, uh, the, the Israelites had done what they were commanded to do, Moses says, you know, did you, you know, weren't the women involved too? You should kill the women and also young boys too. Now, is this a command that is... Um, added to what God has already commanded. And there are a number of scholars who say this seems to be kind of Moses' reaction because, of course, he's angered by the, the women who are involved. But, but again, the initial command that God gave was to you know, the, you know, kill the, 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 the men. Uh, it had nothing to do with the women. Um, you know, so so there, yes, there was culpability. But, but again, so we, we, we do see a number of biblical scholars who say, well, this actually, you know, maybe Moses kind of adding on his own uh, his own perspective that actually wasn't commanded by God. Um, we also don't see anyone taking any action on this uh, either. Um, so, but again, even if this is um, literally true, if this indeed did happen, we go to Judges chapter 6. Now we see that, the, uh, that Israel is, you know, is attacked and plundered by the uh, Amalekites in 1 Samuel 14, 48. This is often lost on people who interpret the, uh, the passage in, in 1 Samuel 15, where God says, you know, utterly destroy the Amalekites. Well, what preceded that? In chapter 14, it says that the Amalekites had plundered the Israelites. So it's not as though it's just coming out of the blue, and of course, the Amalekites had had it in for the Israelites from the very beginning. So there had been animosity. Now, uh, you know, of course, God is willing to forgive, and if the Amalekites had abandoned their ways, you know, well, God, you know, does operate in in this manner of forgiving. In fact, He says in Jeremiah uh, 18 that if a nation, any nation, not just Israel, but if, but if if a nation turns from its wickedness, repents, and you know, and and, and and turns to the Lord, it says that God will have mercy. He will relent from the judgment that he had promised. That's just how God operates. So, so this sort of offer would be open to you know, Amalekites or you know, Assyrians, Ninevites, and so forth. You know, this is how God operated. But again, the, the Amalekites are constantly uh, at the throat of the, uh, of the Israelites. In fact, we even see that in, uh, in, in Esther's reign, when Esther is in Persia, there is Haman the Agagite. Agag was a king of the Amalekites mentioned in 1 Samuel 15. So for, over, for about a thousand years, these uh, Amalekites are at the, you know, uh, are seeking the destruction of the Israelites. But let me, let me move on here. So we see the Amalekites instigating trouble. So their king, we're told in 1 Samuel 15, is ruthless. He's been, uh, had, had, a, had the pattern of making women childless. So Saul is commanded to utterly destroy everything. It says women, children, uh, you know, young and old, and so forth. Um, animals. Well, you know, how literally should we take this? Well, for one thing, though women and children are mentioned, we just see a pitched battle in verse 5 of 1 Samuel 15, where it is, well, Saul, Saul fights in the city of Amalek. Now, on a literal reading, we see that Saul carried this out. In fact, Saul warns the Kenites who are in this city, where the battle is about to take place. 
he says, you've been friends to us. You know, we have no issue with you. Why don't you leave? And, and Because we're really our, our battle is with the Amalekites. And so they do leave. And so Saul engages in a battle with the Amalekites. It doesn't sound like you're going to have a lot of civilians hanging around here, a lot of non-combatants. But what we do have is we have the, the mention of the narrator that Saul utterly destroyed all the people. Again, we have this sort of a warfare text, this, uh, this um, hyperbole uh, that we'll, we'll explore in just a minute. And then we read later on that Sam, Saul told Samuel himself this very thing, that he had utterly destroyed the Amalekites. The rest of the conversation now has to do with the, the animals that were presumably part of the city uh, where the battle uh, took place and that Saul had kept them alive. Um, and of course, Saul was rationalizing all of this away. But the utter destruction, if we, if we see that King Agag, who was killed by Saul, or sorry, by Samuel, is, you know, takes place, if we take this literally, then we'd say, well, all the Amalekites are, uh, are finished off. They're done for. Uh, that, that's it. End of story. But in the very same book, in 1 Samuel 27, and then in 1 Samuel 30, we see that there are, there's a, another army of Amalekites that now David is fighting in the same territory. Again, you know, this vast tract of, uh, uh, of land um, where he's kind of ch chasing them. And 400 of these escape. Now, you know, there's a lot of exaggeration that takes place. In fact, even the very numbers, uh, you know, that, that Saul it mentions that Saul has 210,000 soldiers. Well, this would have been more massive than the, the actual numbers that we know of Egypt or Assyria. That they had, you know, again, that they had more like 150 or 200,000 soldiers at their peak in the ancient Near East. And, you know, it's, you know, and again, Saul no way would have had this much. And again, numbers are tricky. They're often exaggerated in these war texts. Uh, or there may be another way of reading these numbers, as some scholars uh, say. Uh, but again, I don't want to get into that. But the point is that there is a lot of hyperbole that seems to be uh, bound up with these war texts. Now, to illustrate this, and we're, we're winding down here, but let me just say, you know, God even commands the Israelites, uh, you know, or God says about Judah, when, they're in, when they are at you know, the beginning of, uh, you know, mid, mid through, midway through Jeremiah, it says in Jeremiah 25, 9, that God promises that he will utterly destroy Judah. And we read to the end of the book, and what happens? Well, we actually see that Judah has not been utterly destroyed. Judah is still, you know, I mean, it's been disabled militarily, politically, economically, religiously, and so forth, sure. But most of the people remain behind in the land. And we also see the urban elite from Jerusalem, uh, many of them being shipped off to Babylon. So we have a people that are, you know, again, you know, yes, there's a lot of killing, but many of them survive. And again, it, it remain, maintains a certain identity uh, during this uh, Babylonian captivity. But surely nothing reaching this literal, utter destruction that God promises. So we see the land, language used not just of the Canaanites, but also of the people of Judah. And again, this sort of thing does not happen. Now we read also that, uh, that, uh, that Joshua, especially in chapter 11 in, in Joshua, the book of Joshua, where it says that Joshua destroyed or, you know, he carried out all that Moses commanded. So Moses commanded in Deuteronomy 20 to utterly destroy them and so forth. Well, we read in Joshua that they were not all utterly destroyed. So if Joshua is carrying out the commands of Moses to utterly destroy them, and they are not utterly destroyed, then maybe what Moses has in mind is part of this ancient Near Eastern hyperbole or exaggeration that it is not literally meant to be the case, but to have this effect of incapacitation, uh, to have this capacity of disabling. Uh, so this is the sort of thing that we see repeatedly as we look at these ancient Near Eastern texts. So no, God did not command genocide. Uh, total disappearance was not the goal, but it was to drive them out, and any that remained uh, behind left themselves in harm's way. So despite the obvious signs of God's presence, those who were resistant and wanted to uh, persist in trying to fight against this God who trumps the Egyptian gods and who, uh, who makes himself known in the presence of the Israelite camps in very, uh, the camp in various obvious ways, then they leave themselves in harm's way. Uh, so God may command killing in unique, supreme emergency type situations for an overriding good. 
So this is the sort of thing that I wanted to talk about, and we'll, uh, we'll pick up on the uh, question and answer time later on. Uh, but now it's time to call this to a close, and we'll turn it over to Jeffrey. Thank you very much. Thank you, Paul. Uh, that certainly raises some interesting issues and questions, which we'll uh, address, of course, in our Q&A. Uh, let's take a 15-minute break, and uh, uh, which means we'll... Uh, uh, Bill, what is the, uh, do we reconvene at uh, 1045 or 1050? Okay, so that's 15 minutes.